Hawaii. So these are all GMO fields in the southern side and the west Hawaii. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, uh, but this, these are all GMO fields from DuPont and Pioneer, and here's the community of Waimea. And uh, Waimea, in 2011, they filed a lawsuit against Pioneer uh, because they've been claiming, as you can see, the direction of the wind, they've been claiming uh, exposure to dust and possibly pesticide laden dust on this from all the wind that's const constantly blowing. Uh, you have to recall that they are only planting about 10 to 15 percent of the land. The rest of the land is totally bare. That means if there's wind, if there's rainfall, it either blows with the wind or it washes downslope into the ocean. So he, in this picture, we're looking from Mauka to Makai, the same land, the same geomo, and here is the town of Waimea. It is all going down slope. So if there's leaching of pesticides, leaching of fertilizers, uh, you're going to either impact uh, wild habitats here, the river, or the ocean. Or the uh, this is another perspective to let you know how close are the, these agricultural fields close to the ocean. Uh, these are areas with high water table that year-round have to be pumped out. The water has to be pumped out because of, to lower the water table. Uh, so again, if there's leaching of pesticides or fertilizers, you might expect that some of this groundwater is leaching atrazine, Roundup, and other chemicals uh, right into the ocean. And uh, this is the other side of the, the northern side of the town. So this is why, man, I just showed you the southern side, and this is the other side, which, which is again mostly genetically modified crops, biotechnology crops. Uh, we know that they're applying uh, about a hundred different pesticide formulations, uh, 24 of which are restricted use pesticides. Uh, again, so all surrounded by fields. Here's a, a view of GMO fields going into the ocean. This is the brown, brown soil after a rainfall. And if, if you are familiar with agricultural fields in, in Hawaii from plantations, this is like a, a typical view. Uh, this is a drum, I don't know what it contained previously, and these are great irrigation lines laying just along the beach in, in west, on West Hawaii. I keep bringing the, the issue of GMO papaya, which was developed at UH, uh, because it's used almost as a Trojan horse, as a, as a poster child of the industry. Uh, back in the early 90s, uh, Monsanto and Cornell University got together to, to create a group, an organization, to promote genetically modified papaya all over the world. Uh, so papaya, papaya in Hawaii, GMO papaya, was going to be the open the door uh, so everybody else in the world would accept this crop. Uh, but the, the story of, I have challenged the story that they claim of success, that they say the industry, uh, by looking at the statistics, the year prior to the release, and 10 years later, after the release of the GMO papaya. Uh, so after 10 years, we saw 50% reduction in the value of the industry, over 70% decline in the value of exports. We couldn't, we couldn't export to Japan. 50% reduction in the value of the, of the crop, or the price. And 40% of the farmers went out of business. Uh, so to me, that didn't look like a success story, but rather that, that we damage our reputation uh, locally and internationally as a, as a country, as a state that was producing GM crops. And this was the only trait that we have released, despite all of the noise that we made about GMOs and this is the future of, of, for Hawaii, this is the only trait that we have been able to release after 20 years of research. I don't know how much money we have spent with 12 to 15 different crops, but this is, has been the only trait that we have been able to actually release. <coughs> Uh, again, we have not been able to contain the product that we produce at the university uh, and it has ended up contaminating farms within the state and abroad. Uh, these are some instances of con contamination of GM papaya in Japan, Germany, Hawaii, all three counties, and a couple of years in Thailand. So we have not been able to be responsible farmers but by keeping our products within our farms and it has gone beyond to contaminate organic farms, conventional farms, and so on. Okay. Uh, 
uh, according to the article that I just mentioned, uh, there's nothing to worry about the safety from uh, GM papaya. Uh, so the lingering issues of health risks were laid to rest uh, by Professor Gonzalez, which is the creator of the GM papaya. However, there has not been one single study that has evaluated the effect of GM papaya on the population. So his statements of safety are based only on his words or his statements. In the research literature, when you make a statement based on, on a comment, when claims of safety, when there's no data, it is called assumption-based reasoning. And that's just basically an opinion. Uh, just like we make comments on Sunday watching sports, there's no difference. It's basically an assumption comment of the, Dr. Gonzalez saying the papaya is healthy. There's nothing wrong with the papaya. There's nothing to worry about. He doesn't have the data to back it up. So it's just basically an opinion. On the other hand, uh, there's a, a recent publication that just came out uh, on the unknown effects of double-stranded RNA technology. Uh, this is based on the same technology used for the uh, GMO papaya. At the time that we released the papaya, we actually didn't know the mechanism of action of how the, the resistance came about. Uh, but this review on the use of this double-stranded RNA technology is highlighting several potential side effects such as gene silencing and secondary metabolites that could show up on DM crops. Uh, similarly, another review on double-stranded RNA technology was just published on potential effect on non-target organisms. Uh, also, uh, in 2000, late 2012, uh, there was a publication from European regulation, regulators telling us that part of the construct that we inserted on the GMO papaya had a viral gene segment that we did not know was there prior to the release of the papaya. Uh, so we have been consuming the papaya for about 15 years and many other genetic modified crops and this publication is telling us there was a gene segment that had been introduced that we apparently were not aware of its presence. Uh, apparently when we requested approval of the papaya, we did not tell regulators that there's this sec hidden segment was in the, in the construct that we inserted in the papaya. Uh, so the question mark from skeptics is, is this hidden segment causing a side effect on, the, on, on, on our health that we are not aware of? And prior to the release, did we conduct any studies to determine whether, whether this hidden segment was causing side effects or not? I reached out to my colleagues, uh, in March 19th of last year, and on, again on, on September, and I have not been able to obtain a response, uh, especially in the documentation showing that they were specifically aware about the presence of this gene segment and whether they conducted safety evaluation studies to find out if there's a problem with it or not, there's nothing to worry about based on this, based on this evaluation. Separately, this gene segment has been well characterized in the literature, not related to GM crops, but separately. Uh, so we know that this, genes, this gene, which is called gene 6, has these side effects, plus a plant toxin, interferes with host plant defenses, interferes with mechanisms of protein production, common to humans and plants, and disruptor of RNA silencing. That means they can waken up genes that were dormant in the body. And all of this is established in the scientific literature. Uh, separately, uh, in 2001, the Australian Environmental Agency highlighted some potential risks from virus-resistant genetically modified plants, including it may change the dispersal and the evolution of viruses, and it could bring more viral plant diseases and epidemics. So these are all question marks that an independent person might raise about the potential risks of a new genetically modified crop. And all we were asking for from the beginning is, is the, did you conduct any studies to determine whether is this occurring or whether it's not? Uh, and so far we have been unable to get data from the university in terms of any of these potential risks. Nevertheless, uh, industry is saying farmers need GMOs, GM crops are yielding more, they're using more pesti less pesticides, and decades of scientific studies demonstrate the safety 
and wide reaching benefits of genetically engineered crops. Uh, this is from that New York Times article from a professor at, uh, in California. However, the data is not showing that. This is a, a review in a scientific journal uh, that came out last year, and they basically compared agricultural systems of the Midwest in the United States, which are mostly 100% GMO, compared to similar agroecosystems in Europe that are basically non-GMO. The same crops, similar environment, similar socioeconomic conditions, uh, and compared it to systems. And when they, where the, what they found out is that basically the systems were equivalent in terms of yields, uh, and perhaps the yields were a little greater in Europe. Pesticide use was lower in Europe, and the sustainability of the systems were greater in the European system. Uh, so the message or their claims that we the farmers need GMOs just crumbled under the data that these researchers are uncovered based on the analysis over the past 10 to 20 years of uh, GM production in genetically modified areas versus uh, conventional areas. So their claims, again, are not backed up by data. So we have known for a long time uh, that there are several problems with conventional agriculture, with what is called industrial agriculture. And my position is that GMOs are industrial ag version 2.0 which they have exacerbated the issues. They have not reduced the problems of industrial ag. Uh, so some of the issues are fertility decline, environmental impacts, uh, unknown health hazards on the food, including from pesticide residues, very energy intensive, reduced food quality, as mentioned by the American Medical Association, increased farmer debt, which has led to the suicides in, in India, and cost to society, mostly in hidden costs. And again, the experience over the past 20 years with genetically modified crops is that some of these problems may have been exacerbated, not, not reduced from the introduction of GM crops. So the, the bottom line is, are GMOs safe? Uh, and for these, we need a post-marketing assessment. Uh, that means like with a drug, after you release the drug, you conduct a study with those that took the drug compared to the controls. And this is an epidemiological or post-marketing study. However, this is difficult or impossible to document without labeling. And without labeling, there's no traceability and liability. So if something goes wrong down the road, you start getting sick, you don't know where it came from because uh, the product that you purchased was not labeled to start with. So a lot of the concerns that I have raised about GM crops is the un un potential unintended consequences. And one unintended consequence is finding out, just as an example, 15 years down the road, that there was a hidden gene segment that you didn't know about. Uh, another unintended consequence is that all of these parts, of the these are all the construct that is inserted on the plant. It, con it contains the main protein and a promoter to make it work, to switch it on. And as a antibiotic markers, and these pieces of the puzzle are going to break up, and our question marks are, after they break up, do they have a side effect on health or the environment? Another aspect which I'm going to bring up later is that we conduct safety studies on these constructs. However, industry isolates this protein from a bacteria and conducts a safety study on this isolated protein and they do not conduct studies on the entire construct. Uh, however, our question mark is what happens when we as humans consume the entire product from corn or soybean, not the product from the bacteria. Uh, so my position is that we have been looking at the wrong areas in terms of safety uh, for GM crops. So here's some additional information in terms of what we have learned over the past uh, 20 years or so from consuming GM crops. Uh, contrary to what the industry would claim initially, we are learning that the DNA doesn't always break down in the alimentary tract. And I have at least 23 citations that I have just run across. And these are some examples. So the DNA may persist in the digestive system, and again, would it interact with microorganisms in the digestive system or with other uh, parts of the system? 
we have known for some time that it was shown that DNA is also well protected in dead cells in the soil and that this DNA is st it still has transforming activity. So it can interact with microbes in the soil itself. And our concern, of, co of course, can create a third organism. Other research has shown that Bt, which is one of the main GM crops, uh, it's a pesticide contained in the plant itself, that it persists in the environment for 180 days to three years. Uh, this may impact non-target herbivores and higher order arthropods, based on this research. And it has also been found on streams. So the toxin gets re released from the crop because you harvest it, and it goes into the soil, it goes into the water, and our question mark are, can this toxin impact other organisms in some way that we don't understand? And we are seeing that it does in some ways. We are also seeing that some of the antibiotics that we insert as part of that construct, that they also persist in the environment. GM markers found in nearby wells and groundwater. And most recently in China, antibiotic GM markers were found in six rivers, six major rivers in China. Again, interacted with the local biota, becoming incorporated into local aquatic organisms. And the concern is that populations, urban populations, may uptake those antibiotic markers and become resistant to antibiotics when we, they become sick and they go to the clinic uh, to get treatment. We are also learning some of the latest literature that miRNA, which is a type of double-stranded RNA, which I mentioned earlier, found in the circulatory system and organ of mammals. And it can be transmitted from food containing mRNA to humans. It may alter gene expression of target cross-kingdom species. It can regulate the expression of target genes in humans. And this regulation of miRNA has been linked to cancer and other diseases. Uh, there's new products coming into the market, new GM products based on miRNA technology. And this is why uh, these publications are uh, re relevant to the, to the discussion. And these are some of the researchers from China uh, who came up with this uh, research. And also our research uh, from bioscience that I mentioned earlier on the potential impacts on non-target organisms of this miRNA technology. On the other hand, when you, look, when you go and look at the literature to, to find out what has been done in terms of safety for humans, the, the, the reviews indicate the health safety of GM crops, food crops, remain very limited. Very few publications are still available to determine what is the impact of GM crops on human health. Other reviews are indicating that the review process may be inadequate. Uh, for example, in Europe, I mentioned this earlier, focuses almost exclusively on the isolated bacteria produce novel proteins with little consideration of the whole plant. So uh, they isolate the protein from a, produced by a bacteria instead of experimenting with the actual construct that was introduced in the plant. So it's almost like looking at the wrong, at the wrong way for the answer, or the wrong place. Another angle that has been documented in the research literature is conflict of interest. Uh, so most of the results showing no health effects from GM crops have been conducted in association with the biotech industry. So the issue of conflict of interest. Uh, these are some of the health risks that I have come, came up upon. The number of citations is not comprehensive, but I have just run into those publications. Uh, so exposure to GM crops based on animal studies have found disruptions on the digestive system uh, with 14 citations that I found. Liver, 14 citations. The pancreas. Kidneys, 9. Blood, 6 citations. The immune system or allergies. Reproduction effects, five. Again, transfer to the digestive system, uh, including uh, the gut and the fetus, with 23 publications. Uh, BT toxicity, 14 citations. Again, just a brief review of some of the publications that have come out, highlighting, you know, there may be something wrong with these crops. We should conduct follow-up studies. We're getting more and more evidence as well about 
the side effects from the pesticides that are used to grow genetically modified crops. And this is new evidence that has come up uh, from a report in Europe, and they looked at data that was provided by industry to regulators, and these review claims that the regulators failed to look at, failed to properly analyze some of this data, which when you looked at it carefully, it showed some of these side effects from the research literature and from the uh, literature provided by industry. Birth defects, death of, death of the fetus and embryonic deaths, lung, kidney, heart, skeletal malformations, endocrine disruption, DNA damage or genotoxicity, which may lead to cancer, nervous system, neurotoxic, and carcinogenic effects. Similar reviews have been conducted. This is from 19 mammal studies which show liver and kidney signs of toxicity. Uh, signs of CERF could spell the onset of chronic disease. And this is done by uh, the team of Seralini, which you will hear about later. Uh, in Latin America, uh, over the past 15 years, we have actually started to conduct epidemiological studies on the population, which again consists of going to the population that are exposed to pesticides field workers and comparing them with populations in nearby areas that are not exposed to pesticides, but that belong to the same ethnic background and similar socioeconomic background. So the only difference is that these people were exposed to pesticides. These are published in medical journals, and these are some of the side effects that are observed. Birth defects, skeletal malformations and growth deformities, uh, cancer rates up to four times as much, congenital malformations and stillborns, epidemics of cyclopia, one eye, uh, from roundup, extensive roundup exposure in parts of Colombia, uh, where we have all, all drug, uh, anti-drug treatments. They have conducted similar surveys of wildlife in Latin America, and separately, we have conducted laboratory studies in Europe and the United States, and we are observing the same type of symptoms in the animal studies, in the human studies, and in the laboratory studies. So we are triangulating the same kind of symptoms on different types of studies. And then we come to the Seralini study, which was also brought uh, in the New York Times. It was the first long life study. They studied the effect of Roundup and the GMO crops over the entire life of this animal for the first time. And these are some of the symptoms that they observed. Early death of females two to three times compared to the control that did not receive either Roundup or the GM crop. Tumors in males four times as much and 600 day, days earlier than the controls. Liver damage in males 2.5 to, to 5.5 time, times as many times compared to controls, congestions and necrosis. Kidney, severe kidney damage. Uh, and 60% of the outer parameters were kidney related. Also, they found endocrine or hormonal disruption, and these results can be explained by the non linear endocrine disrupting effects. The pituitary was the second most disabled organ, and the sex hormonal balance was modified. Uh, the study has since been retracted, but when you look at all the studies that have been conducted on this NK603 species, if we had used the same parameters to analyze Serolini's work with the studies conducted by industry to deregulate the plant, we would have needed to retract all three studies. All of them would have been invalid because Serolini was by far superior, superior in the number of variables that they collected, the amount of data that they collected, uh, they collected, collected data on 50 different variables in 32 different organs, which is way more than the ones conducted by, uh, by industry, which was used by regulators to say everything's fine, no need to worry about it. So Seralini has responded to this uh, retraction. Ecological risks, loss of biodiversity, super weeds, which they told us it wouldn't happen, genetic pollution or contamination, which they told us it wouldn't happen effect on non-target organisms and other unintended consequences that we may not know about. Again, a lot of the studies that have been conducted by industry, it's almost like they have been looking the, the other way, looking the wrong way. BT safety studies 
again, conducted from the isolated protein of the bacteria, not from the actual plants that we are consuming in feed or as humans. Roundup, the studies have looked only at the active ingredient. They have not looked at the entire package that is actually applied to the plant, and which is found on the residues. We have looked at individual pesticides, but we have not evaluated the cocktail of pesticides that are actually applied on the farm and that we are exposed to. Similar with GM, now we have several BT toxins that are incorporated one on top of the other in the plants, and we have not studied the health of that combination of BT toxins as compared to the single toxin. Uh, GM crops were deregulated so that we would need it, didn't need to conduct safety studies. And we have got regulatory budgets, uh, limiting the ability of regulators to oversee these products. And this is a kind of an example of how everything started. Uh, back in the early 80s for the old timers like myself, uh, an investigative article in the New York Times describes a pattern of fraudulent, fraudulent laboratory testing and of corporations hiding information about the harmful effects of pharmaceutical drugs and plant pesticides during the 1970s, several scandals. Despite of this, presidential candidate Ronald Reagan was campaigning with a promise to further deregulate the industries, including a proposed 43% reduction in the EPA's funds for research and development and parallel increases in interior and agriculture department programs designed to speed development of our natural resources. So that gives you a background of how we ended up deregulating the industry rather than actually looking for potential problems. And then, going back to Kauai, we have to realize that we're not dealing only with GM crops, but we're dealing with a combination of GM crops and pesticides that are used to grow these crops. And Almost by coincidence, the top six GM companies that produce GM seed also control about 70% of the global pesticide market. Uh, so it's almost obvious that, they are, that they will release genetically modified crops that require the use of pesticides, uh, so their profits will increase accordingly. Uh, several scientific organizations have uh, put up position papers over the past year saying we are concerned uh, about uh, the potential effect on children uh, from pesticides and we are promoting the right to know. We should know what is being applied in our backyards so if we take our children to the hospital we can tell the doctor it was product A or B rather than we don't know. And this is from Maya, thank you. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine recently issued a position paper about their concern about toxins, pesticides, and reproductive health. Uh, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Sanev uh, for coming out on a, on a limb with the, the research that she, sh that she has put forward, uh, knowing perfectly well the level of uh, attack that, that, that researchers come about when they come up with controversial uh, data. Uh, the question mark from my side is, how come we haven't actually looked at the issues that she has raised? Uh, how come this wasn't looked at 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, if you look at the literature reviews on Roundup, they didn't even mention the, the, the topics. Uh, from my perspective, uh, she's connecting the dots. Uh, she's finding effects of Roundup on microbial activity. She has found links between nutrient access and several human disorders based on an extensive literature review in the medical literature and she's trying to connect the dots. Uh, so, uh, thank you again. Uh, however, uh, Professor uh, Don Huber has been raising similar kind of issues with respect to Roundup and microbial activity in the soil. Uh, this is based on re several referee publications <clears throat> on the impact of Roundup and microbial activity. Uh, the Dean of the College of Ag in Hilo claimed that this research was coming from what he call it, uh, gray journals or like low quality journals, but this research is actually coming up from top journals from Europe and the United States. Impacts of nitrogen fixation, alter soil microbial activity, impact on growth, yields, growth, and nutrient uptake, 
decreased micronutrient uptake in the soil, and this has resulted in an increased disease incidence. And if you are a farmer in Hawaii, all of these are real familiar to you. Fusarium, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Septoria, Pseudomonas, Phytophthora, Mycotoxins, Anthracnose, and Nematodes. Uh, so if you apply Roundup in the soil, the microbial activity in the soil is affected, and down the road, you might end up with outbreak of diseases. Uh, so a lot of diseases that our farmers have been calling upon over the past 10 to 15 years, how many of them have been caused by previous Roundup applications? Uh, again, this is not uh, wild science. Uh, one of the first papers that I have found on this issue was actually by one of our current professor, pesticide professors at UH, while he was a graduate student at Oregon State uh, back in the 70s, I believe. And he found an increased level of pythium uh, after response to rubber. So uh, the, the literature again has shown that Roundup has prevented the access to micronutrients into the plant, and this again leads to uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, so this is all based on the literature. Uh, reduce micronutrient uptake of iron, manganese, copper, zinc, and nickel. And there's a question mark as to the long persistence of Roundup in the soil. Don, don, Professor Huber claims that it can be years or decades. And our soils in Hawaii are very unique because they fix phosphorus very, very tightly. And Roundup behaves similar to phosphorus. So that means that for us in Hawaii, Roundup could end up hanging out in the soil for much longer periods of time. Uh, we don't know what makes it get released, but it can be on any given year. So the outbreaks could come today, six months, or years down the road. I just want to bring up some hot issues that are coming down the pipeline, if you want to Google them or keep up, be aware of. TPP, trade agreements, harmonization, uh, which would eventually prevent counties or countries from ena in enacting regulations because international agreements would supersede them. Preemption bills, at both at the state and national level, these are coming up in this coming session. Uh, and contamination, efforts by industry to allow the low level presence of ex or contamination in our food. Uh, so if there's low level contamination, it's fine, uh, everything's okay, there's no, no, nothing to worry about. And the, the bottom message that I, I, I try to bring at the end of my talks is that a better world is possible and entire communities all over the world are standing up and saying, we don't accept your world and we have a better vision of what we see as the future of agricultural lands in the land, in our soils. And we have a lot of positive examples to show this in Hawaii and globally, the local food movement, the need for food security and self-sufficiency, move of universities towards sustainable agriculture, which is happening and it should be promoted, greater demand for organics and healthy food, and prioritize the use of farmland for food production and to adapt to climate change. A lot of studies, international studies, have come up saying we need to shift agriculture towards ecological methods of crop production. The FAO, Pretty and other studies, agroecology has a track record and potential to improve, improve crop productivity in tropical regions. Uh, reviews, international reviews of 286 projects in 56 countries with a, about 80 million acres, 80% increase in yields following small-scale ecological farming techniques. Ecological management is based on simple concepts, take care of the soil, biodiversity, develop local seed banks for the community, they promote microbial activity, chemical ecology, which we're talking with Dr. Senef about, promote immune resistance in plants, and develop biostimulants. Uh, we have examples, long-term research at the UH Guadalajara Station for about 20 years, and all over the islands, organic farms in Maui, Kona in Big Island, Molokai, Kauai, and Oahu. Uh, these are farmers on the ground that have been doing this for decades, and we can borrow some of their knowledge along with the local indigenous knowledge to pro promote uh, healthy agricultural systems in Kauai. So thank you all.
you, Dr. Valenzuela. Uh, I think we have a great crowd here tonight, yes. so give yourselves a hand. <laughs> So, um, uh, Senator Rudiman is here from the state legislature. He's from the Big Island and has been instrumental in bringing attention to the need for healthy foods. He owns many uh, natural food stores on the Big Island and has been really a, a proponent for a change in the way legislation is being done in the state legislature and as well as how food is being grown here in Hawaii. So, um, I'd just like to ask those who are capable of sitting on the floor to move to the floor in case more people uh, come in. And um, are you all comfortable where you are now? Yes. Okay, yes. nobody wants to move? Yeah. logistics. If anybody needs to use the restroom, uh, it's over in the Mo'ili Community Center on the first floor, second floor, and third floor. So we can take a five minute break while we rearrange the room a bit and um, we'll reconvene in just five minutes, okay? We also have refreshments in the back thanks to Down to Earth who has sponsored this, uh, this event together with Seeds of Truth. And we'll be filming this for Alelo, so we'll be singing on Alelo shortly. Uh, you can come to Seeds of Truth Facebook and find out more about the dates for upcoming events as well as uh, when this program will be being shown. We're going to have questions and answers after Dr. Senna has spoken. So you We're can on stay. a five-minute break right now. Presentation about Roundup and GMOs. It's a good crowd here tonight. We have people uh, on the floor. What would otherwise be called standing room only. In Hawaii, I guess, called sitting on the floor room only. This concluded was a uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Hector Valenzuela of the University of Hawaii's College of Tropical uh, or Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Uh, if you know anybody that would be interested in this, uh, tweet, tweet or post the link out. Karen, Karen, do you have some a literature about this event, like a pamphlet. Then I can show the people. Uh, what this here? is about. Oh, do you want to switch? Huh? Are you are you filming? Yeah, I'm live streaming. Well, would you like to switch then? Uh, that would get me a little closer to yeah. the center. Okay. I'll switch out I'll, with you. Can I, can I take this? Uh, just this. Uh, you got the sights on there. Sure. Thank you. It's a bit more steady for me. <laughs> That's so cool. Alright. Okay. This helps and it keeps it a little steady. Live stream is a little bit. And it gives me something to keep the battery on. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's hard. for you. There's somebody trying to get the uh, literature.
We're on a break between uh, presenters. people what's coming up. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on a break uh, between uh, Dr. Hector Valenzuela of CTAR, University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, and uh, Dr. Stephanie Senna, who you might have seen uh, testifying. Um, Testifying at the Hawaii here. Hey, and this is what we're at. That's the one. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, let's take our seats so we can get started again. That's me. Congratulations for uh, graduating. Okay, Stephanie Seneff coming up right now. So we're asking all those who are able to sit on the floor to please take their seats. And let's begin again with our next presenter. For those of you who have just arrived, my name is Dr. Melissa Yee from the group Seats of Truth. And together with Down to Earth, we're hosting this event so that people can become more educated about the issue of GMO, Roundup, and how they're both affecting Hawaii personally and how they're affecting the whole planet. So we thank you all for showing interest. I think the world has matured to the point that they understand that something is a brew and it's not good. So that's why we're here to help educate people to bring the issue to the forefront such that when the state legislature begins in just a few weeks, we're prepared to go down and testify to show our concern that Hawaii has to turn into a new direction where we can begin to grow organic farming again, grow organic food for the people of Hawaii, and uh, we can have a stop to a lot of the development that's going on that takes away the agricultural lands from us to provide food for our people. So um, Dr. Valenzuela has just made his presentation. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Seno. She is from the um, MIT, um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and uh, has a home on Kauai. She's been very outspoken as she's learned more about the dangers of Roundup. And she was here last year to make two presentations and has really put a lot of information together for us to be more aware of the dots that connect the Roundup to the effects that uh, it's having on our food supply. So without further ado, I'd like you to give a hand for Dr. Stephanie Seno. All right. Right. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see such a tremendous crowd. You can see that this is a, something people here are taking very seriously. Um, the title of my talk, Roundup, a.k.a. the new DDT, here's a DDT, uh, you probably don't recognize this, um, and GMO food is a danger to our food supply. 
um, DDT, and then we have Roundup. So they're uh, really the same story, history repeating itself in my opinion. Um, uh, quote, ne never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And this was Margaret Mead, uh, a good, a very important statement there. And another uh, quote, our prime purpose in this life is to help others, and if you can't help them, then at least don't hurt them. <laughs> so here's an outline. I have only a few topics here, autism, obesity and digestive disorders, and GMO crops and dying species, but I'll have a lot of slides on each one of those topics. Children today are sicker than they were a generation ago, from childhood cancers to autism, birth defects and asthma, a wide range of childhood diseases and disorders are on the rise. Our assessment of the latest science leaves little room for doubt. Pesticides are one key driver of this sobering event. This is a quote, and I, and I definitely agree with this statement. Uh, as I said, history is repeating itself. I have this book. You guys should get it, Silent Spring. I think you can also get an electronic copy. I read it when I was a teenager when it first came out, and it had a tremendous impact on me at that time. Now I'm reading it again, and it's amazing how much she's saying that's still true today, in fact, much worse today probably than it was then. And, um, and it's the same story. DDT was considered very safe. They were spraying it on the children to, 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 to get the mosquitoes away. They were at, you know, encouraging people to use it. It was perfectly safe. And then, of course, she showed otherwise, um, killing both the animals and the humans and the birds. Uh, so she was, she was really an amazing woman. Uh, this is a nice article here by Laura Orlando here on the web. I recommend reading it. I've just pulled a quote from it. Uh, Monsanto manufactured DDT, so that's Monsanto again, and polychlorinated biphenyls, which are the PCBs. Those are still around, even though they've been banned. They, they last forever. Before they were banned by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, by the Protection Agency in the 1970s, still makes a long list of synthetic chemicals and aggressively markets genetically engineered products like bovine growth hormone and genetically modified seeds. A billion dollar company when Silent Spring first appeared, Monsanto published a parody of Carson's work called The Desolate Year in the October 1962 issue of their magazine. Since then, they have become a corporate role model in sugar coating, unpalatable facts, and silencing dissent. And this is certainly true today. They have become extremely good at both of those things. So my first topic, autism. One of the puzzling aspects of autism is the marked increase in the incidence of autism that began in the United States in the early 1980s and has appeared to increase continuously since then. This is a, a quote from William Shaw, from a, a, a journal um, published in 2013. The rate uh, just last March, one in 50. I think this is a very scary number, 2% of our children. And of course the rise is even more scary because we're, everything we're doing today is getting worse. Everything, all the factors that I've identified that are contributing to autism are getting worse. So that 2% is going to truly go up uh, to God knows where, maybe 50% of the kids by 2025. So I've been studying autism. I looked, started looking at autism six years ago, and I systematically went through all the environmental chemi chemicals they might be exposed to, trying to figure out if it's this one, is it that one. And um, I identified, of course, a number of features associated with autism. It's a very complex condition. They definitely have uh, disrupted gut bacteria. There's definitely a problem with their guts. Deficiencies in critical um, neurotransmitters like serotonin and melatonin. This one's involved with sleep and this one is involved with mood. Impaired sulfur metabolism, this one's a big one, and there's just all kinds of things are messed up with the way sulfur is being handled in the body. So the question is, is there a toxic environmental substance that's been on the rise since 1980 and that could account for these comorbidities? Well, <laughs> I think this is the answer. Glyphosate, that's the active ingredient in Roundup. So glyphosate use has risen 1,500% between 1994 and 2005, and it's continued to go up since 2005. And that's a quote from this. 100 million pounds of glyphosate is used every year on more than a billion acres. So this is the plot that really, really struck home with me. This is a plot of two things. The red line is glyphosate. The amount of glyphosate that's applied over time, 1991, 2010 on corn and soy and then this part the boxes 
is autism, the rate of autism wow. in the school system in the U.S. I mean, I think this is astonishing. This is like a 0.99 Pearson correlation coefficient. So correlation doesn't always mean causation, but in this case, I think it does. And my question was, okay, if it's this correlated, what, how can I connect those dots? How can I explain that? So I got together with Anthony Samsel. He's an expert on environmental toxins. And we wrote this paper with a rather cumbersome title. Cytochrome P450 enzymes are going to be an important part of it. Amino acid biosynthesis, gut microbiome, you can see the keywords there. Pathways to modern diseases. Um, so this paper was published and uh, we talked in that paper about some of these issues here. So glyphosate, it's now the number one herbicide used in the U.S. and it's increasingly being used worldwide. It was developed by Monsanto in the 1970s and first got introduced in 1974 into the food chain. 2000 it came out from under patent and then it started showing up all over the world because it got a lot cheaper. So that's also very worrisome. So what does it do? It inhibits an enzyme in this pathway called the chicmate pathway, which in, is involved in the synthesized synthesis of these three amino acids, which are called the aromatic amino acids. Now there's been a huge expansion of GMO corn, soy, cotton, canola crops, which has caused a huge increase in the use of Roundup. And furthermore, because these crops don't die, they soak up the Roundup and it gets into the food. And I'll show that later. So when it's a GMO crop that's Roundup ready, and you put Roundup directly on that plant, you're going to have more Roundup in your food than you would have even if it was a conventional crop grown in a field where Roundup was used to kill the weeds. So is it non-toxic? Monsanto has certainly argued that it is, and people treat it carelessly for that reason. You can go down to your local hardware store, it's not regulated. You can, you know, you, you can really get up close and personal with it. People aren't worrying about it. Um, and the argument is we don't have this pathway, so how could it harm us? Our cells don't have that pathway, so that sounds like a really great thing. But the problem is that our gut bacteria all of them have this pathway. And that's going to screw them up. When they get exposed to Roundup, they can't make those amino acids. And we can't make those amino acids either because we can't do it in any case. We're depending on them to make those for us. So when they can't make it, we don't have it. And our plants can't make it either because they're exposed to the Roundup, the GMO crops. So they're deficient. So we're getting a deficiency in the diet, a deficiency because of the gut not being able to produce it for us. And then we've got a really big problem. Now also the other ingredients in Roundup greatly increase its toxic effects. Those are uh, private under patent, so we can't know what they are. But they are causing glyphosate to be much more toxic than it would be by itself because they're allowing it to get into the cells. And then there's an insidious effect of glyphosate um, because you don't have, when you get these small amounts, you don't notice an immediate problem. But over time it erodes your health. And eventually you will become very ill. And so most of the studies that are done are too short. Now, Seralini was the exception, and of course his paper got retracted, which I think is really, really shocking, that they were able to do this retraction of a paper that, on no grounds, uh, just because they didn't want that paper to have the legitimacy. So here's a bunch of biomarkers that I identified for autism, gut bacteria disrupted, inflammatory bowel, low serum sulfate, methionine deficiency, uh, serotonin and melatonin, these are those neurotransmitters, Defective aromatase, various deficiencies in zinc and iron, and that was already mentioned in the previous talk about glyphosate uh, causing the plant to take up less of this. Vitamin D deficiency. This is interesting, urinary therapy, so I'll say more about that in a moment. And then these other problems here, immune functions, nitrate ammonia, chronic low-grade inf inflammation in the brain. All of these problems uh, can be explained by glyphosate, and we talk about that in our paper. It's, it's amazing. By the effect of glyphosate on biological systems. So, um, so here are the main effects of glyphosate. First of all, we know about the shikimate pathway, and that's going to cause this, this interference with the synthesis of these aromatic amino acids. Also, methionine is reduced, and that's a very, very important sulfur-containing amino acid. So it disrupts sulfate synthesis and sulfate transport. It really messes up the sulfur system. It kills these beneficial gut bacteria. It allows the pathogens to overgrow. And it interferes with this collection of enzymes called cyp enzymes, which are incredibly important in the body. I was astonished when I started looking at all the things that cyp enzymes do for you. And when those are not working, you've got a lot of problems. Chelating important minerals, that's how you get low zinc and low iron. So, um, so here's aromatase. Aromatase is a cyp enzyme. And here's a quote. Aromatase protein is significantly reduced in the frontal cortex of autistic subjects relative to sex and age matched controls. Deficient aromatase. That's a side enzyme. It converts testosterone into estrogen. 
So it's, that's what causes it to be causes autism to be associated with more more with boys. Boys have like four or five times as much autism as girls because they need this enzyme to get estrogen, which they need to have their brain develop properly. Now this was a fascinating article that I that's just been come out 2013. There's been a lot of work being done on the gut lately. All of a sudden they realize, oh my God, the gut microbiome it's really messed up. It's really a problem, and everyone's taking probiotics. And this was a, a really fascinating article on mice. And what they did was they, um, they could engineer these mice to be autistic and they could actually measure their autistic behavior. But they found that if they treated them with probiotics, they could actually cure their autism or at least make it better. So good bacteria. So what's happening is that they have a, a, an overgrowth of bad bacteria. Uh, and those bad bacteria are producing these, these GI metabolites, in particular p -cresol. That's the thing that's overgrown in autism. It's associated with autism, and it's associated with these autistic mice. And giving them probiotics straightens things up for them. And so we're, people are using probiotics a lot for autistic kids as well. Um, what is amazing is that in the same study, they could, um, so these mice suffered from a leaky gut, just like autistic kids do. They had a reduced level of this bacterium and, they were, and their gut was producing this uh, me metabolite called 4-ethylphenyl sulfate, 4-EPS, 4 46 times higher than what it was in the control group, way overproducing this metabolite. And that's very closely related to P-cresol, which is this toxic phenol that's produced by these pathogenic bacteria. So it's produced by Clostridium difficile and glyphosate induces Clostridium difficile overgrowth. This is how you get the connection. And it's been shown that this is the case. It's been shown that this produces P-cresol, and it's been shown that P-cresol is excessive in autism. And so, in fact, they could actually just take normal mice and give them this, this toxic phenol and produce autistic behaviors in those mice just with that one toxin. Very strong link and very powerful paper. Side enzymes, again, now looking at D3, all of a sudden we realize, oh my god, everybody has a vitamin D3 deficiency. You know, they sort of woke up a few years ago and said, you know, this is handing out vitamin D3 like candy now. The babies are given it when they're born, you know. It's really, um, the country has woken up to the fact that we're all deficient. The reason why we're deficient is because the side enzymes aren't working. And that's because of glyphosate. That's what I believe. So the liver and also the kidneys activate the vitamin D. And you can see all these side enzymes are involved in, in activating the vitamin D. So when you get the glyphosate in the liver, the vitamin that the side enzyme isn't working, your vitamin D is not going to get activated, it's not going to work, you're going to have vitamin D deficiency. Um, so that, that's the epidemic. And also the autism, which is associated with vitamin D3 deficiency. So now serotonin and melatonin, I mentioned them before. These are neurotransmitters in the brain. And if this is a sort of chart that we drew in our paper of how glyphosate will deplete serotonin and melatonin in the brain over here. All these arrows are showing glyphosate down, glyphosate up. These two, synthesis by gut microbes, so the gut microbes can't make the tryptophan because they've got the glyphosate interfering with their tryptophan pathway, and the plants can't either. So you've got both of these sources reduced in the supply, supply chain. Once it gets in, you've got all these macrophages that are fighting this inflammation because you've got all this overgrowth of the gut, that, of the bad bacteria. All the immune system comes in, and those guys suck up the tryptophan and turn it into chimurinine. This is not. So you're losing whatever little bit of tryptophan you might have had, you're losing it to the chimurinine, both the endothelial wall and the macrophages, and you've got other needs for it too as well. So by the time you get to the point where you're trying to produce serotonin for the brain, there's nothing left. So that's why you would expect to have a serotonin deficiency. And in fact, this, uh, it, so it's disrupted by glyphosate and it's the sole precursor to both serotonin and melatonin. Melatonin is what you need to sleep. And sleep disorders are associated with a whole bunch of different neurological diseases. So serotonin levels in autism mothers, mothers of autistic kids, were significantly lower than in the mothers of normal ch children with a very high, very um, significant result. And serotonin deficiencies linked not only to autism, but also to obesity, depression, Alzheimer's disease, and violent behavior. So this could be explaining, you know, many of these problems that we're seeing today could all be explained by the serotonin deficiency produced by the lack of tryptophan, again, going back to that shikimate pathway. So, just to re recapitulate, autism rates have been increasing at an alarming rate in recent years, in step with increases in glyphosate exact match. It's associated with disrupted gut bacteria, overproduction of p cresol deficiencies in serotonin, zinc, iron, vitamin D3, and aromatase, and all these biomarkers that are associated with autism can be explained by just looking at what glyphosate does to biological systems.
Okay, obesity and digestive disorders. A nice quote from Dr. Roy Dittman. I met him at a, at a recent Autism One conference, and I think he's really needy. He's, he's got a really good recommendations for how to protect yourself from having an autistic child. If the microbial world is a substrate for life, then why are we waging war on it? Very good question to ask. The same chemicals we use to sterilize our environment sterilize us. So be aware of that. Okay, is glyphosate making us obese? <laughs> Here's a, uh, a talk from a paper, and they were arguing that sugar consumption could be related to obesity. And they went all the way back to 1700. This is the year 1700, sugar consumption pretty low until 1850, started to go up and then like that. And this is the obesity epidemic right here, how much we were growing fatter over time, looking at 1900, which is where they had the first data. When you look, glyphosate was introduced to the food chain in 1975, and there's the point right Whoa. there, and you see all of a sudden a complete corner in that curve in 1975. I think glyphosate is the most important factor in the obesity epidemic. Um, here's another graph. These graphs, by the way, were produced by Nancy Swanson. She has a bunch more graphs on her, on the web, and they're terrific. You should really look at them all. It's very scary when you see all the different diseases and conditions that she's found correlated with glyphosate use on corn and soy. So this is deaths due to obesity. People who were so fat that they, that they call, called that the cause of death. And you can see here we have two things. Glyphosate applied to corn and soy, that's the red. And then we have um, the G, a percent of corn and soy that's GE engineered to be Roundup Ready. So as you change your corn and soy to be Roundup Ready, the amount of glyphosate that's retained in the food goes way up, even more so than however much is, is applied to the plant. So you can see that both of these curves are pretty well matched with this uh, death rate due to obesity. So gut microbes and obesity, our microbes outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. Their genome outnumbers our genome 100 to 1. So they are really, really important to us. They do so many things for us. 200 to 800 different species in a typical person. And glyphosate can cause, as I said, the overgrowth of pathogens, releasing the toxic phenols and causing all the problems that we're seeing. Inflammatory bowel disease and a direct path towards obesity. Um, so in fact, they've done an experiment here where gut microbes from an obese person were introduced into a mouse and it produced an obese mouse. So just from the microbes, just by having the microbes that were growing in that person's gut, the mouse became obese. This is a paper with a very complicated graph here. I'm not gonna go into all of this, but this was interesting. Again, brand new, 2013. And they have here repeated antibiotic treatment question mark, starting this whole thing off. Question mark, notice that's the only question mark in here. And I was thinking the same thing. I wrote a paper on autism a while back and I could explain how, once you had the disrupted gut bacteria, you could end up with the autistic brain. Because you get inflammation in the gut, and you get the gut-brain axis, and you get, inflammation, you get uh, inflammation in the brain, and you get brain damage, and you can make the autism. I had the whole paper, and I wrote it, and I was very dissatisfied with myself because I could not explain what was causing the disrupted gut bacteria. If I had that, I would have the whole story. And then I went and heard Don Huber's talk, and he said, that the glyphosate disrupts gut bacteria. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I know the answer now. <laughs> so um, this antibiotic treatment is actually glyphosate. Glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic before it was pat patented as a, uh, as a uh, herbicide. So it is an antibiotic, and it kills the good bacteria. It messes up the balance between the good and the bad. So that's glyphosate. And then you have over here LPS. This is the lipopolysaccharides from pathogens. So that's, of course, going to happen once you've got the glyphosate overgrowth of pathogens. Up here, you have this sulfate. So um, loss of beneficial bacteria, and glyphosate lowers this. There are papers that talk about it specifically lowering this particular bacteria, which is a good bacteria. And then sulfate. That's the thing I was keyed in on with uh, autism, sulfate problems. And that happens, reduce sulfate with the glyphosate, and then you get the leaky gut that's associated with autism. So all of this fits with the glyphosate. And, and that's going to lead to obesity. So America's two-headed pig, <laughs> these have been showing up. I mean, and I can imagine what might be causing that. An excellent book by Leah Dunham, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and she had, her father was a, uh, um, veterinarian who dealt with the pigs in the Midwest on the farms. And so he saw them get sicker and sicker over time as they were eating more and more GMO crop foods. And so she uh, wrote about her father's um, experiences and really captured the story where she saw glyphosate playing a critical role 
in the degeneration of these pigs. Um, so some of the things she mentioned, first of all, some cows. Cows are born too weak to walk and large joints, limb deformities. As many as 20% of the piglets experienced what was called failure to thrive. Once they were weaned, they refused to eat. They would not touch that. They would rather die than to eat the food that was given to them. And the cows on a diet of GMO corn and soy developed twisted gut, ulcers, and other digestive disorders. And then she mentioned extensively glyphosate as a likely candidate for causing these problems in these animals. Um, and here's an article that supports what she says. This is also quite recent, 2013. All these things are coming out in the most recent year, which is encouraging. The, the pigs have a very similar digestive system to ours, unlike the cows. And um, these people were noticing anecdotally that these pigs were getting trouble with their stomach inflammation, stomach ulcers, all these different thinning of the intestinal walls, all kinds of problems. So then they did a formal experiment where they looked at 168 pigs that were just weaned, and they fed them the typical diet, which is GMO, soy, and corn loaded with glyphosate, and then, but the other half got organic food. So half the pigs got the GMO diet. And they looked at their, after they were killed, they looked at their guts and they found this enormous problem with inflammation in the guts of the pigs that were eating the GMO foods. The female pigs also had a swollen uterus, 25% larger, and the females were 2.2 times as likely to get severe stomach inflammation, and the males were four times, so they were more susceptible to the stomach problems than the females were. Um, and this is another story in Europe, and this is a, uh, uh, this guy, e. Peterson, who produces 13,000 pigs a year supplying Europe's uh, pork, and he also noticed when using GMO feed, I saw symptoms of bloat, stomach ulcers, high rates of diarrhea, pigs more with deformities, but when I switched to non-GMO feed, these problems went away, sometimes within a matter of days. So really amazing how quickly you can turn that around if you straighten up their diet. Human digestive system disorders. So we're seeing an alarming increase in the U.S. in many diseases related to the gut. Crohn's, inflammatory bowel, colitis, acid reflux, gluten and casein intolerance, celiac disease, leaky gut. You've been hearing about all these things, right? Gut-brain axis links them to neurological disorders. That's how you're going to get the autism and Alzheimer's disease. And I believe glyphosate is the major cause. So here's another plot looking at this. This is BT, so that's another one that's contributing here. BT has the, and he mentioned it, BT has the pesticide built into it. You eat the plant, you're eating the pesticide. It's, a, it's an insecticide. And if you look at BT, hospital discharge diagnosis for inflammatory bowel disease, very good match with the BT uh, GMO uh, crop. Which one is it? Uh, BT corn, yes, of course, that's the only one that's BT, BT corn. So a, a great match there. So you've all been seeing the gluten-free section of the grocery store. I never heard of gluten-free when I was a kid, you know? Right. All of a sudden, everybody's gluten-free. What's going on with this? And you've got all these products to choose from. It's uh, celiac disease, same thing, right? Epidemic, hidden epidemic. I mean, the problem is, to me, the problem is that glyphosate is causing this disease. And, um, and it's really amazing. Well, I'll get to it in a moment. But basically, it, I said this already. It kills these good bacteria, bifidobacteria. Um, and those are specifically depleted in celiac disease. So there you've got the link right there. Celiac disease is also associated with an increased risk to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a cancer. Glyphosate has also been linked directly to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So um, that's another tie. And I've actually, Anthony and I are writing a second paper, and we have a whole bunch of, um, a lot of ties between glyphosate and celiac disease that we talk about in that paper. It, has, it hasn't been published yet. <coughs> So here's what's interesting with celiac disease. So it's wheat, right? Wheat is what the problem is. And what's happening, and you probably don't realize this, is that wheat is getting, wheat's not GMO. I mean, they haven't been able to get the GMO wheat into the market because the farmers have refused it. But they've discovered that it works out quite well to spray the wheat with, with glyphosate right before the harvest, just a few days before the harvest. You know, glyphosate's harmless, so it doesn't matter if it ends up in the seed. You know, no one's thinking about that. So if you, this is something I got from this article. Um, talking about pest management, if you see ryegrass, so you get ryegrass mixing it with the wheat, that's not good, because that's a weed. And so uh, you, what you want, it may be resistant, so what you can do is, you, it, and when you run, when you harvest weed, you can scatter the seed of the ryegrass all over the place, and you'll get a lot more ryegrass next year. So what you can do, you can kill the ryegrass before you harvest the seed, by putting the glyphosate on it. I mean, that is like, oh my god. <laughs> so then you do this approach where you burn down, use a burned out herbicide. And, and this, so we may be able to knock out 80 to 90% of the resistant ryegrass with glyphosate. And this is what's happening. More and more they're adding, they're putting glyphosate on the wheat crop 
right before the harvest. And the glyphosate is getting into the gluten and messing up the gluten so that you have an allergic reaction to it, and that's why you're getting gluten intolerance. And we talk about that in the paper that has been published. So um, they're actually doing it not just on wheat. They have a lot of other crops. Here we go. Wheat, barley, legumes, corn, sunflower, kiwi, grapes, wine, raspberries, apples, soybeans, alfalfa, sugar cane. All these are worrisome now. You know, it's not GMO, but it's still problematic because it's going to have glyphosate in it because of this, this, this practice. Patients maturity to harvest, they consider that a good thing. Weed control for next year's crop, get a head start on next year's weeds. Reduce the green material, therefore make it easier for the harvesting machinery. So these are why they think it's good, you know? But then um, you can't wash the herbicide out. This is a huge disadvantage. And so you're going to get contamination in animal products as well because they're eating that food. So here's a plot, hospital discharge diagnosis of celiac disease. That's the gluten intolerance. And this is glyphosate applied to wheat. Not corn and soy, but wheat. And, you know, pretty good match, right? So dramatic increase in hospitalizations of U.S. children with inflammatory bowel disease. No, no surprise here, right? This was a study at Case Western. They looked at more than 11 million hospitalization records, and they looked at kids, kids people under 20. 49% increase from 2000 to 2009 in Crohn's disease, 71% increase in ulcerative colitis discharges. So these kids are getting these in, in, uh, intestinal problems because they're being, I think, because they're being exposed to glyphosate. Pseudomonas, interesting. This, there's only a few bacteria that can break down glyphosate, and Pseudomonas is one of them, this guy right here. Pseudomonas are aeruginosa. This guy is a gram-negative bacterium, and it's a major problem today in hospitals. And that's because it's resistant to every antibiotic you can throw at it. So hospitals are having an enormous problem controlling this bug. And it produces formaldehyde, which is a well-established neurotoxin, as a byproduct when it breaks down glyphosate. So you're caught between a rock and a hard place. I mean, this guy is going to grow because he's got glyphosate. Nobody else can grow on glyphosate. He's happy. Great, I'll, I'll just eat the glyphosate and he can, he can flourish. Everybody else is dying around him, all the other microbes. He's going to overgrow, and he's going to produce a formaldehyde, which is going to be toxic to the brain. Um, and also depletes thiamine, which is an important nutrient with body meat. So agricultural workers around, in, in, in the sugar cane in particular, both in Central America and in India, are dying at a remarkably young age in record numbers from kidney failure. This is known, and everyone is trying to figure out what could be causing this. And of course, they're not looking at glyphosate because glyphosate is harmless. Uh, so they're asking maybe arsenic, maybe excess use of Tylenol. Well, it turns out glyphosate disrupts the side enzyme that breaks down Tylenol. So Tylenol becomes much more toxic in the context of glyphosate. And I think that's an issue also with autism. Because when you give autistic, autistic kids, when you give, give kids a, uh, something to kill the fever when, after they've had a vaccine, that's going to become toxic if they've got glyphosate in their system because they won't be able to break down the Tylenol. So what's killing young men of contrast? This is a uh, dust cropping, crop dust in playing. And here's an article that I found, which was written in 1990, where they studied the effect of error application. This was to look at the possibility of using Roundup to ripen the sugarcane, which is the same thing as the desiccation um, in Costa Rica, that's Central America. So I think this totally explains it. They've been increasing the use of glyphosate right before the harvest, and the people who are working with it are getting sick, are getting kidney failure. So here's another plot, acute kidney disease, death rate, plot against glyphosate and GMOs. These same two, this is the glyphosate, this is the GMO corn and soy, and here's the death rate on kidney disease. Very good match. And you can see we have a huge problem, we have a huge and increasing problem with kidney um, failure. All these people on dialysis these days, it's a very big cost in our country. We have very high kidney failure rates in Louisiana where they grow sugar, sugar cane. I mean, it all fits. So, recapitulation, glyphosate disrupts gut bacteria favoring pathogen overgrowth. Obesity can be encoded in gut microbe, dis microbe distributions. Pigs fed a GMO diet develop inflammatory gut. The pig has failed to thrive. Inflammatory bowel diseases are on the rise in America's youth. Kidneys are failing and agricultural workers are exposed to glyphosate. And glyphosate application over time correlates with death from kidney disease. Okay, GMO crops and dying species. Corporations have become the new gods of fundamental religion, fundamentalist religion, and they call it GMO. This was very disturbing to me, and I don't like to get involved in the politics, but this is from WikiLeaks, and these are quotes. And basically, the U.S. ambassadors, U.S. diplomats, are working directly with Monsanto to penalize 
the European countries, threatening them, if you're going to start messing with the GMOs and refusing to, to do that, we're going to do trade embargoes, we're going to mess you up, we're going to mess up your economy. It's really scary to think that our government officials are working as Monsanto diplomats to try to make sure Monsanto's products are sold in Europe. Um, and this is a nice quote showing how well GMOs have worked. Exactly none of the supposed benefits of GMO crops, including increased yields, more food production, controlled pests and weeds, reductions in chemical use, drought tolerant seeds, have actually materialized. Greater pesticide use, herbicide resistant super weeds, 130 types of weeds in 40 states are now herbicide resistant, and then increasing costs, cutting yields, leading to the use of more powerful and increasingly toxic chemical herbicides. Not a good plan. You know, the system is broken. It's not working. Um, so here's the growth in GE crops. These are just genetically engineered. Some of them are genetically engineered to be Roundup Ready, actually a substantial percentage, 70 or 80 um, percent. And you can see all these different crops are becoming up to 90 percent GE from only close to zero in 1996. So this has happened over the last 15 years. There's quite an enormous change in our food supply over the last 15 years. Um, and then I just learned 2,4-D resistant plants are coming soon, it's about to be approved. You're going to have plants that are resistant to both glyphosate and 2,4-D. All, always these chemicals work synergistically to be much more toxic in combination than they would be individually. So I think that 2,4-D is going to make the autism situation much worse. That's my prediction. Um, if you look at glyphosate versus other pesticides, you try to say, okay, autism, maybe it's glyphosate, you get a perfect match. Well, maybe it's something else. Let's go look at the other pesticide to see if that matches. Nothing else matches. Everything else is, is, is flatlined. No growth in uh, insecticides, no growth in herbicides. Only glyphosate has gone way up in the, over the same time period that autism has gone way up. Um, super weeds. So as you put in, as you add more and more glyphosate, you get more and more super weeds. You know, they're just basically becoming resistant because they're getting so much exposure. They're very smart. These uh, plants can adapt and they can just turn into like is it resistant, you've got to put in more. That's what's happening with the GMO crops. All the weeds are getting resistant, you have to use more. And they argued the exact opposite. They said that the GMO crops would reduce the amount of pesticide that's used. And of course, it has not happened at all. Um, so this is a brand new article, uh, just accepted, just, just published. Um, and they were able to discriminate. They're looking at soy. And they looked, they looked at conventional and organic and GMO <laughs> soy. And they showed, without exception, Substantial non-equivalence. They always talk about substantially equivalent, and they show and they use this term substantial non-equivalence. Definitely not substantially equivalent in terms of compositional characteristics of the soybeans that were GMO versus the others. And this is uh, showing the amount of glyphosate, the red, and AMPA, which is an immediate degradation product of glyphosate, in the various ones, organic, conventional, and GM. And you can see all of it's in the GM. The other ones didn't have any. Even the conventional, which was used with glyphosate. Uh, to kill the weeds, didn't have any. So this is what's happening. The glyphosate is getting into the food because the food is GMO. U.S. approved genetically modified alfalfa, major source of hay for cattle and horses, nature's fourth largest crop behind corn, soybeans, and wheat, Roundup ready. So there's another problem, right? The, the animals are going to get Roundup in their, in their alfalfa. And so Professor Don Huber had a lot to say about this. Um, manganese levels were reduced by 31%. Sulfur, again, and I talked to you about sulfur deficiency, 52%. Amino acids, 15%. All these are down. Um, EPA says 440 parts per million glyphosate is okay in alfalfa. That's how much can be in there. 80% stays in the plant, 20% moves into the soil, and then it's going to stick around for other crops. All these things get harmed. Important um, microbes in the soil. It takes only 0.1 part per million, 400, 0.1. That's like 4,000 fold more than what it takes to produce dysbiosis of the gut tract and for chronic botulism, leaky gut, etc. So way, way more than the amount that it takes to do damage is allowed in the food that the animals are eating. One square foot, public park near Cape Town, South Africa, lots of neat stuff in it. Just take a square foot of soil and you'll see what's in it. Very rich with life. You look at the corn stalks in the GMO cornfields and you find nothing. A few mosquitoes, you know, and maybe a grasshopper, and then everything is just corn. Extremely depleted in life. So where have all the insects gone? Have any of you noticed? When I was a kid, you drive in the car, you have to clean the windshield all the time with all the bugs that get killed by the, right? There's no more bugs. I mean, I find I'm amazing now. You can drive 
for a long time and not have to clean your windshield. I mean, it's pretty scary, I think. The bugs are disappearing. This was very popular, this bug. We called it, um, this is the, uh, the ladybug. They were all over the place when I was a child. I haven't seen a ladybug in years. I mean, has anybody seen a ladybug? You guys have some here. That's awesome. <laughs> There's a few left. Well, they're really dying out. They've been dying out for a long time. Um, and then um, this was one of the most common ladybug beetles, this particular one. I guess it might just be this particular one, which I remember. The nine-spotted beetle. Uh, monarch butterflies. You all know the monarch butterflies are falling apart, right? They, their migration pathway goes right over all the GMO cornfields. And um, they have uh, the, the most widely used weed killer in the United States, the engineering, the GMO, has wiped out the milkweed, which is what these guys eat. So the milkweed's loaded with glyphosate. And the, these butterflies are eating it, and well, guess what? They're dying. So that is glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide. Bee colony collapse. I mean, everyone's probably worried about the bees, right? You know all about that. I think in Hawaii, right, you've got problems with the bees? Maybe not. <laughs> Certainly over the, in the mainland. Um, so Mercola had an interview with Don Huber, and Don Huber was explaining all the reasons why the bee colony collapse syndrome relates to glyphosate. Everyone is saying, you know, insecticides, neonicotinoids. Don Huber and I both think glyphosate is a key factor. It's a combination between glyphosate and the neonicotinoids. So they're mineral deficient, that's because glyphosate depletes the minerals. They can't utilize the food, that's because their metabolism is screwed up by glyphosate. They don't have these bacteria that are reduced by glyphosate. And then they get endocrine disruption and they become disoriented. So glyphosate explains all the features, chelation uh, and disruption of gut bacteria. 30% mortality in bees drinking water containing glyphosate at levels found commonly in our drinking water. So it's killing 30% of the bees. And then the other canary in the coal mine are frogs and amphibians, because they're disappearing just like the trees, just like the bees. So I think we should be alarmed. I started looking at all these different species that are disappearing. Uh, we've talked about the butterflies. They're the second largest pollinator. So they're, both the bees and the butterflies are really important for pollinating. The bats. Bats eat an enormous number of insects. They eat their whole weight in insects every day. So they're a really good control. They're a good pesticide. I mean, the bats, if you've got bats, you can kill, you can protect your plants from insects. But we're killing off the bats with this problem. This is very modern butterflies, bee colony collapse disorder. Starfish on the west coast are dissolving. They've got a major problem with their skeleton. No one can figure out what's going on there. Well, it turns out they have these um, mussels being grown, and the mussels have this weed, seagrass, that's infiltrating the mussels. They use glyphosate to kill the seagrass, and the starfish try to eat the mussels, and they get, and they get in trouble. As again, it's glyphosate. And then you've got the white nose bat syndrome, which is killing the bats in New England, and uh, fungus infection, fungus infection, fungus infection killing the frogs, and fungus infection killing the bees. So what's this, what is this about fungus? Roundup herbicide enhances the growth of these fungi that produce this toxin. So I think that all the fungus infections are tied back to glyphosate. So it's a growing threat in the GMO Roundup Ready corn, and here's a picture of it. And the research is consistent with the studies on other fungal strains, such as all these guys, you know, the blight fungus and the rest of them. These are all causing trouble now with the plants, all the fungus. It didn't used to be. So um, emerging fungal threats to animal plant ecosystems in the past two decades have seen an increasing number of virulent infectious diseases in natural populations and managed landscapes. Both animals and plants, unprecedented number of fungal and fungal-like diseases have caused some of the most severe die-offs and extinctions ever witnessed in wild species and are jeopardizing food security. So we've got a big problem with fungus. And this is very interesting. This is, again, a brand new paper, 2013. Uh, I guess I don't have a date there. Um, and it's got a lot of information on this. I want you to take a look at this part over here. Look at all this red right over the United States. The United States uses 25% of the world's glyphosate. So it's not surprising that it's got a concentration of all this fungus problem. The red is fungus over here. You can see a huge amount of red. And this is over time, 2000. We're having an enormous problem here. We're going to have probably a much worse problem the next time when you look further. This is 2000 to now. You can see the green is the plant. So the plants are getting the problem first, and then the animals are starting to get the problem here. But the US has got a really big concentration, and Europe, of a fungus problem in the animals. So going back to bee colony collapse syndrome, bees are exposed to many insecticides from pollen, and their resistance depends upon side enzymes. 
and so those are disrupted by glyphosate. So I think side enzyme disruption in the liver would impair the human's ability to detoxify other environmental toxicants. So this means that glyphosate makes everything else you're exposed to much more toxic than it would otherwise be. The honeybees ha are, have a, unfortunately not that many side genes compared to other insects. So they're more susceptible to the problems of uh, glyphosate. Less pesticide detoxification capability. Uh, so this is, this is arguing that that would explain their sensitivity, but when you add on that the top, on top of that, the problem that glyphosate is disrupting the side enzymes, then it makes good sense that the bees are suffering. So the white nose syndrome in bats has reached epidemic proportions in the U.S. Northeast since 2006, and it corresponds to increases in glyphosate application. At least a million bats have died since 2006. Uh, and they wake up repeatedly during hibernation which suggests that they have a melatonin deficiency because that's related to sleep disorders and melatonin goes back to tryptophan related to glyphosate. Uh, my last uh, slide on this section is, uh, you can't see that very well, this was this very disturbing article that was in the Boston Globe, where I, in Boston where I live, um, and they showed a bunch of pictures and these are just three of them, of these kids who have, and also this person who's dying basically probably of kidney disease or something, he's probably an agricultural farmer in, um, Argentina, where the GMO soy has caused, it used to be, it breaks my heart, grass-fed cattle, that would have been so terrific, and now the grass-fed grass -fed cattle farms are being replaced in massive amounts by this um, GMO soy, and it's causing a lot of illness among the people there. So, recapitulation, according to WikiLeaks, the U.S. is launching military-style trade wars against other nations on GMO <coughs> issues. Tremendous growth in GMO crops corresponds to tremendous growth in glyphosate usage. Bees, bats, frogs, ladybugs, starfish, and monarch butterflies, among many other species, are suffering unexplained collapse in recent years. Fungus infection is a major factor. Glyphosate induces fungus infection in plants. Fungus disease rates are growing alarmingly in both plants and animals, and humans exposed to glyphosate are getting sick. So my last slide before the summary, and my most important message, which I hope you guys all embrace, go organic. This is a picture from our kitchen table. We have gotten very close to being 100% organic now. We're, we buy, we're, luckily we live on the North Shore of Hawaii. We have all these little uh, little tiny towns, each of which has an organic grocery store. And so we have really tried to maintain a strict organic diet. Um, and it, we have felt healthier as a consequence of that. And I would encourage everybody here to try. I know it's more expensive, but you will save a huge amount when you don't get Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> Summary, I believe we'd be very worried about glyphosate in the food and water supplies, its disruption of gut bacteria, depletion of essential amino acids and minerals, interference with cytochrome P450 enzymes, have widespread consequences. It may be the most important factor in the recent die off of many species, and it may also be the most important factor in the U.S. health crisis related to all these problems obesity, autism, celiac disease, kidney failure, etc. Thank wow. you. These are two brilliant people that we have in the room today, and we like to um, explore their minds as best we can. So if any of you have a question to pose to either one of them, please come up to the front, line up here, because we need to record this for Alelo so that they can catch the questions as well. So if you'd like to pose your question with this microphone and um, direct your question to either Dr. Senef or to Dr. Valenzuela. And thank you all for coming today. We're going to be showing this in Alelo on YouTube, so stay tuned to uh, Seeds of Truth Facebook page, and then you'll find out when this is going to be shown. Any more people with questions? Please, come forward. I'm Jared Freeman. So when I first heard about GMOs, I felt really foolish because I felt like I'd been blinded for a long time. So I was wondering, how can I make a change in GMOs? What should I do? Good question. Good question. <laughs> I think the most fantastic thing you could do is to grow up and be an organic farmer. <laughs> that's, that's what's going to save you. <laughs>
you know, learn how to farm organically. And, and I think by the time you're grown up, that's going to be a huge industry because everybody's going to yeah. know that this stuff is poisoning us. It's going to be, it already has a really strong growth right now. The organic is really growing strongly and it's going to continue to grow. So uh, learn how to farm the right way and do it because we're going to need you, you know? Blood. Um, setting up a protest help? Definitely. Definitely, yeah. Join the protest oh, movement. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> In, in terms of how you can help, I guess just education, uh, sharing the information you have with, with, other, with others around your friends and stuff. Uh, I don't know, things may have changed recently, but early on I would ask questions when I would give a talk. How many people were aware that they had been consuming GMO papaya for the past 12, 15 years and only a few people would raise their hands and a lot of people just weren't aware of it. So right. yeah, just sharing information with friends and about what you know. Hi, my name's Bob. I'm uh, one of these fools who trust the government, but less all the time. And I'm curious about uh, your MSDS sheets that you read on glyphosate. They say, you know, this is how big your problem is and follow the rules. And uh, it certainly flies in the face of the information that we've heard tonight. Why can't the government get, tell it straight? And, and does somebody have to sue them to get them to play the game fair? And when we talk about glyphosate, it's one thing to kill a weed, and then all of a sudden it's about what we're eating. The, can you go into market across the street and test and see that it's actually in the food that we're eating? Are there ways that we can prove this? I get involved in the newspaper on the comment section. Every day there's something about GMO something, or several articles. And then there's a comment section. and. Um, and it's, uh, it's really frustrating to have these guys just say it's not true. I mean, somebody's lying. And, uh, you know, I guess we're all the jury. That, that would, I'm pretty clear about how it's going to line up in this room. But what can we do to, to um, get a fair playing field? And, and what about this? And how, what is the half-life of classic thing? In other words, when they make that stuff and it starts to break down, how long does that take? I mean, your lecture was basically about that chemical. Um, but there's a lot of questions there, but um, in terms of the breakdown of glyphosate, it actually, they say it breaks down really fast, but it doesn't always. And I think you mentioned that too, that sometimes in certain soy, soils, and apparently it, we have that kind of soil here, it takes it a lot longer to break down because it can get trapped and secured and therefore it doesn't break down. And then later on it'll get opened up and you know, cause problems later, long after it was actually applied. Um, in terms of uh, measuring the glyphosate in the food, very, very frustrating. When we wrote our paper, Anthony and I, we combed the literature trying to find any evidence uh, of it in the, in the body, and we couldn't find anything. We, no one had measured it. And after we published our paper, there was one uh, report that came out in Europe where they looked at 18 countries, uh, people from cities in 18 countries in Europe, and they found measurable amounts of glyphosate and AMPA, which is the breakdown product, in 43, I think it was 43% of the people that they studied, which they were really surprised that it was that high. Because these were not people who were working with it. They were city drawlers. They, would, they figured they must be getting it from their food and from their water. Um, so that's that one. And then in terms of, I mean, the governments, I don't understand, honestly, how the governments can ignore the kind of data that I'm seeing and then stand with a straight face and say glyphosate is not a problem. I do not understand that. I hear people say, oh, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. When you see over and over all these diseases, and I didn't show you Alzheimer's, but it's exactly like autism, exact match between glyphosate and, and Alzheimer's. And of course, Alzheimer's is shooting way up also. You've got obesity, autism, Alzheimer's, all these digestive problems, you know? Kidney failure. I mean, these things are all matching perfectly with glyphosate. And then all you say is correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. I mean, come on. Somebody should look at it, right? It's very frustrating. No money is being, you know, you, you have to be working on a shoestring budget if you're doing this research because nobody's going to fund it. And the government ought to be funding it, but they're not. And I don't understand how they can be so controlled by the industry just because the industry is making a lot of money. I mean, it's all about the money. It's all about the money. 
And it's just incredible to me that we're going to let this happen because of the money. It is so ridiculous. Yeah, I'd like to comment on the big business thing. I guess, uh, remember there was a time when they were always talking about separation of church and state. I think it's pretty much a time for us to have a separation of big business and state. Yes, you know, thank you. It's a big yes. problem. Yes. But uh, I, I see like the presentation, is it more the use of rice for say, in terms of industrial farming? Is that the problem? Um, and also my second question related to that, is it, is it a problem with home use? Good question. I know, I didn't talk about home use, but I'm very worried about that, particularly because people don't think it's toxic. They've been told that it's non-toxic for humans. So they go buy some down at the hardware store and they're applying it carelessly, not even into protecting their skin. I mean, there's some instructions about how you should protect. I have never used Roundup my entire life. I just don't like toxic chemicals, so I just always had a lot of weeds in our yard, you know, and that was fine with me because I didn't want to use the poison. but. I imagine that people use it carelessly because they're not thinking that it's toxic. So they're probably getting some serious exposure. Those who are sort of using it to kill weeds in the yard are probably suffering from it. And you imagine children playing in the yard. You know, there was a school, my, my daughter-in-law told me at her school, they delayed recess by an hour because they were applying glyphosate. You know, I mean, one hour, come on, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. Thanks for being here and sharing all this information with us. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Nika, and I, my question is uh, with concern to glyphosate in the water systems, I mean, penetrating the water supply and such. Um, you touched on a little bit, but and I know that you at your own personal table are kind of just going back to the basics with organic uh, food, trying to get to that 100% number. But what about the water supply? Are you going to bottle water? Are we worried about using our hoses? How is that uh, kind of getting into our waterways? Did you want to speak on that a little bit? I suspect the water is also a huge problem. And of course, again, it's not being measured, so we don't know. And I don't know which water to drink, quite frankly, because the bottled water may not be any better. You know, it's everywhere. And so, uh, I mean, I have a horrible story that I didn't talk about here, but in uh, Washington State, uh, eastern Washington State, around a waterway, they had a, a weird uh, series of um, births of children that had um, a very, very rare disease called anencephaly, which means they didn't have, their brain was missing. They were born without a brain. And they had seven or eight cases of this over a short period of time. Ordinarily, it's one per year in the entire country. This is so rare. And so they, of course, they looked, they had all these chemicals they were using, and they investigated various ones. Turned out they were using a lot of glyphosate to kill the weeds around the waterway that was being used for the water supply. And they didn't study glyphosate at all because glyphosate is harmless. But glyphosate <laughs> actually produces microcephaly, the small brain, in uh, frogs, in tadpoles. So they've seen that glyphosate. Studies have shown that glyphosate can produce the condition that these kids had. But nobody thought to study glyphosate because glyphosate is harmless. This is what's happening. No one is studying it. And I think maybe Monsanto is making sure that no one studies it because they know that's a huge money maker for them. They don't want to see that banned. I think it should be banned. And I'm sure that Monsanto is not happy with that, with that plan. Yes, follow-up question. My name is Renee. Um, follow-up question on the water, and I actually think I probably know the answer to this already. But for the food, go organic. That's a solution that everyone can follow. So the water supply, I doubt if it works, but what do water purifiers, what effect does that have on something like this? I actually don't know. I should look into that. I don't know. Whether a purifier would take it away, I don't know. I think purifiers are very clean, get rid of some uh, pesticides. Uh, however, I wanted to add that we're also talking about a cocktail of chemicals. So Roundup is just one of the one of the pesticides that we're talking about. Again, in Kauai, we're talking about almost a hundred different formulations. 
24 four restricted and the pesticide themselves also have breakdown products. Uh, so when we conduct safety studies, we only look at the specific active ingredient. We don't study at the health effects of the secondary tertiary products or combinations with other toxins. Uh, I also wanted to mention that regulatory agencies I mentioned were, have really been watered down bro or broken down. Uh, a lot of our agencies work based on scientific panels and we have seen that all these scientific panels are filled with industry people. Uh, so these are the guys that make recommendations about safety studies, about what are the s s safety standards, what level should be allowed to be a safety allows a level of standard. So we have seen case and case again when they are real high compared to what you see in other countries. Uh, some of the pesticides are still used in the U.S. and we know that they have been removed uh, in Europe and other countries. Thank you. My name is Dale, and I want to thank you both for the amount of information you put out tonight. It's, a lot of it's new this year or last year, so that's helpful. And I'd like to get out of the Petri dish. My family and I have been trying to convert to more organic foods, been working with uh, grocery stores and things like this. But is it really possible? I mean, can we really reverse whatever effects we've experienced so far from a poor diet or from an ignorant diet? by going organic? One hopeful thing I would say is these uh, pigs, because when they reversed them yeah. from the GMO diet, they started improving very quickly. So it's possible that you can actually heal um, by stopping it. I mean, I'm hoping that's true. Even autism, I think, a good question whether autism can be quote unquote cured. And I've studied autism a lot, and I want to remain optimistic that you could actually potentially reverse a lot of the autism behaviors if you provided a healthy environment for that brain, that it could heal itself. I mean, I believe it's possible, um, to some extent, maybe, but, you know. The studies that I have seen in terms of pesticide residues, when people are given a different diet, is that when they are shift to non-pesticide or organic diets, uh, the charts show the pesticide residues in the body just going down for the respect, respective chemicals. Uh, personally, I I'd rather go, I take small steps myself uh, in terms of my diet because we're all s s slow to change. Uh, but in Hawaii, we're lucky that we can grow food year round and we can grow it everywhere, even in Lanai. Uh, so I started growing, I've been growing food in a community garden for the past several years. Uh, so this is something that we can do and it's not just consuming food, but it's also for ourselves to get closer to the land as, as, as people, working with the land, getting closer to it, and this becomes a family activity. So we share with the keiki, we share with the kupuna, uh, so it becomes more of a community activity uh, going away from the centralized world that we're, individualized world that we're living nowadays. Add that that's, to some extent, that might be the only way you can make yourself safe is to grow your own food. And I hate to say that, but I suspect there's going to be a lot of cottage industries of people growing food in, in their own yards as they become aware of the enormous problem that we face uh, that will help to tide us over when we have to do this amazing transition into massive organic uh, crops. People will have to take complete ownership of their food to grow their own in order to be safe from these chemicals in, the, in a transition period. Because all of a sudden there'll be such a demand for organic, there won't be enough of it available, I suspect. Uh, my name is Gary. Got a couple of questions I think would be pretty quick. Um, do you think you can buy uh, organic non GMO papaya in Hawaii? There's a store down the street that sells it. Are they really non GMO? <laughs> <laughs> cool. 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 Uh, the other thing is, um, Laura Allred said, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. This kind of pisses me off. Uh, how are things around the water cooler, coat machine, or whatever you UH? Because, you know, what I hear you say is very different from what other people there say. And I think the majority of, of the other people say something very different. So when you present this to your colleagues, what kind of reaction do you get? 
So first, the papaya. It, it, it is possible to buy organic papayas, but this is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, today it is possible to do a, a laboratory test. You can send your samples to the extension, just like you get a tissue samples, and they can sample to see if it if it's contaminated, if it has GMO traces. Uh, however, I think if you think generation in 50, 100 years, it may be possible to, to find a papaya that is not contaminated. Uh, today they have gone to the fields to take surveys, and in Oahu, I think, in feral papaya, they found about 20% level of contamination just on the streets and so on, so increasingly it may become difficult. In terms of the situation at the university, the old school pro-GMO, the, the guys that were strong pro-GMO, when they see my information, they think I'm anti-science, that I don't belong to the science community, and they told I'm just making it up or some, something wild like, like that. Uh, this is more like the old, older generation of faculty that were the, the really promoters of GMO. I think we have a new generation of faculty that are more open-minded and, and looking at a, a, a different... So you're not alone? Uh, I don't know. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still alone in terms of speaking out. And one of the problems is that I faced a lot of resistance over the past uh, 10 years, and I think young faculty, I have talked to even faculty from all the departments that are saying, and I'm not even going to touch that, that, that subject, just because it's too hot. Wow. And they are, of course, thinking about getting promotion and right. going up the ladder, and they don't want to be for, for seen as raising up a, a difficult issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wish that the university would come real strongly in saying, we defend academic freedom, and anybody can say, speak their mind. But I don't think we're at that level yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been blessed at MIT because I've been able to do this work so far and I've been funded for it. So, um, um, luckily, my funding agency has very little to do with, has nothing to do with glyphosate and Roundup. So, uh, they, they're not uh, feeling that pressure. But I think um, it's very hard to get funding for this kind of research. Um, in general. I want to, my name is Mike. I want to thank you, doctor, uh, for your bravery. And uh, I learned tonight about your home on Kauai. I did not know that you are uh, one of us, uh, the rainbow people. So I'm so happy to hear that. Um, what got me interested in your work and your research and your papers was that astounding correlation between autism and uh, of course that's just the beginning as we're finding out tonight and learning so much so how do we get copies of that graphic so that we can all go home tonight and put that on our Facebook page yes. number one I'd like to know I'd like to you to tell me about that and then about the bees I'm a Costco person and I love Costco because I can get corn chips that are non-gmo and they're the cheapest ones and uh, the uh, edamame um, hummus is non-GMO, and the, their um, soy milk that they sell is, and they say, they label it non-GMO. I, I hope they won't be intimidated to toe the line, but um, I, uh, where was I going with that? Anyway, um, <laughs> thank you for being here, and uh, we do need to become very vocal and militant about this. I meant to put a, a pointer to my webpage on the slides um, because you can go to my webpage. It's a little complicated, but it's uh, if you just type my name, actually, you'll probably get the first hit. It will probably be my webpage. If you can remember Stephanie Center. But it's uh, people, P E O P L E, dot C S A I L dot M I T dot E D U slash Center. And on that page, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you could read, including a pointer to. Um, pardon? Today's talk is also there, yeah, but it's going to be hard to remember, but it's in a subdirectory called glyphosate, and it's got like some stuff. I should have, um, oh, you want it? It's glyphosate. I'll, I'll post it. It's not, you'd have to know it in order to find it at the moment, but I will put it up so that you can find it and link to it. Um, Senef, S-E-N-E-F-F. And I have a pointer to the paper. Uh, that, that was produced by Nancy Swanson that has all these different graphs of um, correlations between Roundup and a GMO corn and soy 
and all of these different diseases. So she's, she's got an amazing set of graphs that, she's a physicist and she um, suffered, was suffering from health problems and was trying to eliminate certain foods and then she found that once she went 100% organic she started healing. And then she started looking, because being a physicist, and she found you. This information is all available on the web. She's not doing anything fancy, just looking up the numbers from the U.S. government on the, on the GMO, on the glyphosate, and on the um, different diseases, and plotting them up. I mean, that's amazing to me, that it is so easy to find that, and yet no one else seems to be aware of it, you know? So that needs to get out. I think we really need to push Nancy Swanson's data. It's very compelling. So uh, you can go to our Facebook page, Seeds of Truth, and uh, we'll post her PowerPoint presentation and also provide a link for you to reach her, web, uh, her website or Facebook. Yeah. Okay, so that'll be available, Seeds of Truth. Also, Down to Earth website. Down to Earth website. Well, oh, uh, H. Doug Matsuoka, <laughs> who is live streaming tonight. Uh, you can find on his, um, on his website the... Um, program tonight, as well as information about Dr. Sinop's um, various uh, studies. So um, it's available out there. Seeds of Truth, H. Doug Matsuoka. <laughs> and Down to Earth's website. Yeah, hi, my name is May Poimono. And um, my question is more like an application. Um, you're talking about the microbes in the gut, which I think are completely fascinating. And I was wondering if there's any um, probiotic formula that you recommend above any others, because there's so many, it's so confusing. It's like, if it is, but you know, so are there any that are more effective in kind of creating that healthy environment? I unfortunately don't know the answer to that, because I agree with you that there's a lot out there and I have not specifically done the research um, I do trust Dr. McCola, so it could be that if he has something and he's promoting it, it might be pretty good, because I think he sells good products. And he's, he checks his things out quite carefully, I know that for a fact. So I guess I would recommend something if he recommends it, but I don't know what that is. Okay. okay. Is it down to earth probiotics? <laughs> <laughs> so the main thing is to be eating more whole foods, live foods. Vegetables, fruits, what your teachers and your doctors have been telling you for years, but now it's time to do that. Um, the definition of uh, organic is non-GMO, no radiation, and um, no sewer sludge. So if you buy organic, uh, preferably the USDA certified organic with a green label, you'll be almost certain that it's uh, non-GMO. So that's a starting place. So therefore, there is such a great demand for organic food, organic farming, and you have to be a part of it in the future, I do hope. Thank you. You, you partially answered uh, one of my questions a minute ago. I wanted to ask if there's a website we can go to to find summaries of these studies, which I didn't quite catch the reps, so I'll ask you to repeat that if you would. My other question is specifically, you mentioned that glyphosate was originally an antibiotic first. That's astounding to me. I wonder if you could tell a little bit more about that. And I want to thank you scientists for the bravery that you've been showing and standing up and presenting. Yeah, that's the so neat. He's also a senator here in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, okay, so my website is people. People, P E O P L E. It's HTTP colon slash slash people. You know, HTTP always starts. People dot C S A I L. C SAIL. That's actually Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, that stands for. C S A I L dot M I T dot E D U. And then slash SENEF. S E N E F F. It's not a very easy site to remember. <laughs> but I do think if you type, even if you just type SENEF, you might probably find me. Uh, I did that today. Oh, good. Okay, great. So if you just remember SENEF, S-E-N-E-F-F. -E oh, the antibiotics? Yes, right. Um, yes, I, I, I was surprised to see that too, but it makes sense. Actually, glyphosate is anti-life, basically. I think it basically kills all life, you know. I mean, all the good guys get killed by it. Um, the good microbes and all the uh, plants and the animals 
except for this, you know, they, I think they found this microbe growing uh, where they were producing the glyphosate, this microbe that had this resistance, and then they took the gene out of the microbe and stuck it into the plants um, to make them resistant. And now I think what's happening is that because plants really share ideas with each other, the genes are very, they're very promiscuous, and I suspect that the plants are actually sharing the idea with the weeds, so now the weeds are becoming resistant because they've got the same thing the plants have. I think it's quite possible that's what's happening because you get all these resistant weeds showing up when you have the resistant plants. So um, that's just not going to work, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a battle we're going to lose, basically, if we're going to try to kill weeds this way. It's not viable. And we might as well just stop now and try something different, it seems to me. I can give a, copy, a PDF copy of my talk to uh, Seeds of Truth. We put it on our website. Oh, great. Hi, my name is Nikki. Um, I was just wondering if there's any type of supplements or types of things that you can eat that help chelate the, the pesticides out of your body faster than just switching over to organic diet. If you just wanted to make it happen faster. I guess what I would recommend is to beef up your sulfur, because I told you sulfur is depleted. I think it's that we have an epidemic of sulfur deficiency um, in our country because of it being depleted by the glyphosate. And also because we don't recognize sulfur as a nutrient, it's quite surprising that it doesn't have a minimum daily requirement. So when you buy a box of cereal and it has 100% of the MDR of everything under the sun, no sulfur. I mean, it doesn't mention sulfur because of its lack of an MDR. And for some reason, the nutritionists have decided that sulfur can't be deficient, but it's not true. You see severe sulfur deficiency in these autistic kids and also associated with Alzheimer's disease. So you need sulfur, and you can get it from certain foods. Um, one is seafood, eggs, um, meats, um, cheese, and then the vegetable domain, all the green vegetables, broccoli, and also cauliflower, onions, garlic, so a lot of the greens. Green vegetables and, and uh, seafood, eggs, dairy, those are all good sources of sulfur. Uh, so eat those, and then you can also, there are certain supplements that contain sulfur, such as taurine, glucosamine sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, um, MSM. MSM is, uh, is really the sulfur, um, uh, methyl sulfonyl methane is, is the one, um, its purpose is sulfur, so that's a good way, methyl sulfonyl methane is a sulfur, sulfur supplement. And also soaking in Epsom salt baths, is, which I really think is a great idea. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, and people can use it to sort of uh, solve achy e e e muscles after a long hike or something. But it's really useful just to get sulfate into your system because sulfate is really a problem. Sulfate is a derivative of sulfur, it's sulfur with oxygen. And I think its deficiency is a critical problem uh, in a modern lifestyle. And what about, does glutathione play a role? Glutathione is also, you're right, glutathione and also acetyl methionine and acetyl cysteine. Those are, both, those are all sulfur containing uh, molecules that the body, very important to the body. So do you think it's good to take supplements that are a precursor to glutathione? Yeah, well, actually, I don't. I would much rather do a few nutritional okay. if, if possible. But, but, but if you had a deficiency, maybe that'd be a good way to get started. Yeah. Okay, so when you ask a question, you have to speak into the microphone. Oh, Otherwise, we don't pick it up on the, uh, on the uh, program. But Dr. Valenzuela? I, I just wanted to add that part of the local food movement is buying from local farmers that you know, know personally. So you actually know the type of food that they're growing, the type of vegetables that you're growing, and so on. And uh, I think one of the movements is, is try to get institutions to buy, purchase more local products. Uh, right now, the, the school system, they go through the military or commissary and they get all mainland stuff. Uh, so there should be a greater move towards having institution, local institutions purchase from local growers. Uh, right now, our farmers don't have that ability to do, so this involves actually growing more farmers as well. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, we have the consumption from food, but also the pesticides that are in the air and in, in the dust that people are getting exposed if you live in the North Shore and so on. So uh, also becoming active to try to enact legislation to try to prevent chemicals that are coming uh, from other sources. Uh, right now, the thinking of policymakers is that the farmer is growing, applying chemicals and the pesticide stays there. Well, this is an island and yeah. pesticides that you apply in the windward side if there's a strong gust of wind, that pesticide may move to dozens of miles uh, in, in a matter of time. So 
uh, part of our diet, but also part of what's going on in our environment as well. Two ways you can get uh, the chelation of the um, pesticides out of your body is uh, mennonite clay or bentonite clay. You can take either baths or internally, and also zeolite, which is uh, volcanic ash um, in a solution. So those are two ways that American Indians have stayed healthy all these years. They bathed in the clay and they also consumed it. But that's only for short term. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, my name is Gage. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for coming out here and doing this because um, I know this has been kind of like a, a dirty secret of like the food industry and not a lot of people know about it and a lot of people I know don't know about it. Um, and honestly, I didn't know half the things that you just talked about. You used a lot of big words that I didn't understand, but I could kind of get the gist of what you were saying. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank you guys. and. Um, you guys were talking about the what you call the secondary and tertiary effects and how they could combine with other pesticides and like you're just talking about um, I already forgot it the, the G the G word like that one yeah that one. <laughs> um, sorry um, you guys were talking about all these other ones all, all these other chemicals that are that are used in combination to it and that's just one chemical and you link that to like numerous um, diseases and um, so I was just wondering, and I want to know what you guys thought as you know, scientists that have studied all these different things, um, how far reaching and how, what, like what is the magnitude of, of like the totality of all these things put together on like, not just right now, but like maybe 10, 15, 50 or 100 years, of, like, how, like what is the true extent of, of, the, of the disease, the death, autism, you know, people being born with two heads or no brain or you know, all these other t terrifying things, you know? You know, what did, in, in, in your studies, what what do you believe to be the extent, or can we even know? Well, I'm quite alarmed, because if you just take the plot of the autism and you just project it into the future, given that all the different factors that I've identified associated with autism are not being fixed, they're getting worse. So I would expect that the autism will keep on climbing. And I'm predicting, you know, 50% of the kids with autism uh, by 2025. I mean, if that's true, it's going to be really a nightmare. And I think, I mean, I'm wondering at what point, how sick do our kids have to be before we finally face up to the fact that we have a problem? I don't know the answer to that. I'm surprised that, you know, somehow people just go along, yeah, you know, it's fine. And, and yet when you look, you see that the kids are sick. It's not just the autism, but the ADHD, the allergies, the asthma, you know, the obesity, the um, anxiety attacks, and I mean, all these things, sleep disorders. There's a ton of problems these kids are having. And uh, we just somehow accept it, you know? Depression, I mean, it's amazing to me that we're not waking up and recognizing that this is indeed a problem. I mean, I am, but it doesn't seem like a lot of people are, so it needs to, we need to. Awareness. I, th I think we're dealing mostly in unknown territory, and when the American Academy of Pediatrics, they have come up with several position papers. One of the early papers was saying, we have about, we're releasing about 80,000 or so chemicals into the environment, and we have conducted studies only on a few thousand of them. Uh, so we actually haven't studied uh, a lot of them, say, say, same with, with pesticides. Uh, and the earth, the land, and humans are very resilient. And with climate change, people were saying, we, you can only push the earth so far. And we know that we have, we're probably over past the stage where the earth said, I cannot take it anymore. And now we're in a cascading effect. I think it's the same with health. Uh, we as humans are very resilient and are able to keep on going. But at one point, are we starting to give up? And perhaps all this skyrocketing of diseases is a, a sign that is saying the, the load of chemicals has been surpassed. And um, I have one more question. Um, in your studies of GMOs and, and how the government relates to it, um, I guess like, like, I'm trying to think, I'm sorry. Um, Like with, with GMOs and current like legislation and like regulations and, and things like that, and like we already know that a lot of rep representatives um, are in different you know uh, agencies and 
uh, regulation bodies of the government, and they're pretty much like, pretty much like, like protecting it. Like, like yes. their, it, it's its presence in our food is being protected. And um, so I was just kind of curious as to like what, like what are the like the current like things that are allowing that or like enabling them to continue to do that, and like how can we, you know, politically begin to. Um, you know, maybe express ourselves or, or, or change things. So the the government has has been called as it as, as it being captured by industry. That means all the policies that, that it develop are greatly influenced by corporations. The last resort of the people is home rule where you can make decisions at the local level. And this is what we had with the last few bills right. in, in Big Island and on Kauai. However, my last few slides, I mentioned the issue of preemption. So industries coming up and saying, counties are no longer going to be able to make regulations. Uh, right. And it's even going at the national level, but this trans-Pacific partnership agreement. Uh, so as citizens, you can make efforts to the legislature and say, I don't want this level of preemption to come up to our communities. Right. Thank you. I think if you come to our Seeds of Truth uh, Facebook, you can see uh, all the latest happenings with regards to legislation, both uh, locally and nationally, and you can uh, sign petitions. You have to get involved in the legislative process. You know, a lot of people are reluctant to do it because they say they don't have time, they don't want to run as a candidate. I have actually been considering running as a candidate, you know, and that's the last yeah, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. I've ever wanted to do in my life. But I feel compelled to do it at this point because it's gone so far. So all of you who are out there just sitting back and saying, well, you know, Dr. Hector will take care of it, you know, she'll yeah, take care of it. Right. No, you who are in this room and are staying here right. have that commitment you have to make very, very soon because we are at a tipping point where we can turn it around, but we're also at a very toxic point where we may not be able to save the planet. So I don't want to scare you, but I do believe that we can empower ourselves through coming here, becoming educated, running for office, and voting. How many people in Hawaii don't vote because they're so frustrated with the system? So therefore, these legislators and these city council members can run rampant with your money and with your land and they can get away with it because they continue to do it and it's not going to stop until you get involved. So we have to do it, you have to do it. Hi, my name is Grace, I'm a registered dietitian and uh, I'd like to make a few feedback and I want to ask, ask one question. Is that uh, I want to say that I, I go to farmers market a lot and I'm surprised to find that some farmers, uh, some farmers actually sell GMO crops, right. and they're proud of it because it's so sweet and looks so good and it's so cheap. And so it's very important to ask them, to make sure that uh, they do sell organic or at least natural, because when they certify organic, that it means the water has to be filtered and they might not have that capacity yet. So that's one one thing I want to say. Um, second thing is that. Um, I want to say that I, like you talk about the, the zeolite, as you know, like we know each other through the zeolite. And I'm, I'm very passionate about the zeolite product that is like at least 16 times more effective than the regular natural zeolite rock. It, I believe they even go to the brain and take out toxins. And we have very good results, like hundreds and hundreds of autistic children turning around with good results. But my question is that, uh, what is the molecular structure of the uh, glycophate? Um, I know it's kind of deep, but it's important to me because I don't want to struggle alone in the dark <laughs> looking at the website. I think you're the expert, you're the best to, uh, to tell me. Uh, because this zeolite product um, is very, very negatively charged. So if it's neutral or positively charged, it won't take them out. So I'm very curious with this uh, compound glycophate that you talk about. Uh, what is the net charge of this compound? It's negatively charged. It has a carbonate and it has a sulfonyl and it has a nitrogen and a carbon. It's a pretty simple molecule actually, but it has negative charge. I, I have a question. 
It's, it wasn't asked, and I'm, I'm a little bit, it's a little bit hard. Hi, I'm Doug. I'm sorry I'm live streaming that on. <laughs> I, I want to thank uh, um, you for the presentation. And you spoke, uh, I think, um, Dr. Valenzuela spoke about the effects of the uh, glyphosate and other chemicals on both uh, flora and fauna, on animals and on the other plants uh, involved. Now, Hawaii, uh, historically and, and currently, uses the ocean as um, a food supply. Is, are there any studies or on the impacts of these pesticides once they run down into the ocean on the uh, food fish and food seafood? I think some of these pesticides are well, well known to affect uh, aquatic life. Roundup is well known to affect, uh, both, uh, also atrazine to affect uh, aquatic life. Uh, we do have information from other regions, from Europe, uh, Australia, and so on. But in Hawaii, I don't think we have conducted those studies. Uh, back in the 70s, we, had, we did have some chemical pesticide professors that were monitoring pesticides from plantation agriculture. Uh, but I don't think we have followed up on, on, on those studies. Uh, so in, in Hawaii today, we're still dealing with the legacy of the chemicals that were used during the plantation era, right. with pineapple, sugarcane, and so on. Uh, one of our organic farmers is growing in the North Shore. He's been there for about 12 years, and he just realized that his water was contaminated with some of the pesticides used by, uh, by the plantations. And, and he was just, how can I be certified? Uh, because he's an organic farmer, but he, when he sells his product, he doesn't even tell his customers. He just does it because of personal principle. Uh, so to find that his water is contaminated is well, wow, that's a, that is a, a, a little shocking. Uh, but uh, my thinking is that we have kept our heads under the sand because we actually haven't conducted the type of studies that we need to determine all these uh, side effects. Okay, so unfortunately we're running out of time. Any possible last questions? Um, we really thank you for coming today. Yes. Let's give them another hand.
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for all the work you do too. Now there's gonna be while I while I got you on camera. Uh -oh. um, my question is, you know, we know there's gonna be an attempt at legislation to limit um, the kinds of ordinances that came on county uh, at county level. We're calling that preemption. That's preemption. the new word for that kind of thing. What do you think? What is it? You think that'll succeed, and or what do we have to do to prepare? What we have to do is have lots of people be very vigilant and watch for every change in bills that come out of certain right. suspect committees. Right. And I think there are people statewide going to be watching, but they're more than better. And when we find something like that, it'll Just probably be inserted like in the crazy. middle of the night. Right. Spread the word. Right. Facebook, everything and get a lot of attention shine on it so right. that we can uh, defeat it. There's people watching for it. We know they're going to do it. You know, the whole reason they're fighting on the county level is because they can't, we can't they get can't it done. They can't do it at the, at the higher level. level. They've all been preempted. Oh, I hope that will change, but I'm excited about the county level things because of that. And it is an election year coming up. It is an election year. <laughs> and it's my year. I really think that... Uh, I think that will be the solution, and that we need to have some change that comes elect electorally. Right, right. It needs to be seen that Monsanto money won't protect against this wave of concern. Right. And as soon as that happens once, I think the dominoes will it can, fall. It will, that's because right. Because no one that's will right. want to hide behind that anymore. That's right. In the past, that's always been all you need, is Monsanto on your side to get elected. Right. And I look forward to that change. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. That's good. We got a uh, interview with Senator Ruderman. I'm gonna back off here. Um, before before I sign off, I'll I'll show you that Olello was here and. Eventually, you may see this on the air, but you are seeing it. You are seeing it right now. You're seeing it right now on the air. Oh yeah, you can you can catch the beginning of Hector Valenzuela's 